I'm Jackie Shapiro, a former chair of the NGO Committee on the Status of Women here in New York and a UN representative for ECPAT USA. Today's panel, No Child Left Behind, Ending Social Discriminations That Make Children Vulnerable to Trafficking, will be moderated by ECPAT CEO, Lori Cohn, whom I have the pleasure of introducing. Lori came to ECPAT in November of 2019 from Sanctuary for Families, a leading New York City service provider and advocate for survivors of gender-based violence. At Sanctuary, she founded the highly praised Anti-Trafficking Initiative, which provides assistance to women and children who have been victims of sex trafficking. A graduate of Yale and Yale Law School, Lori has conducted trainings in the United States and abroad for attorneys, prosecutors, judges, law enforcement, and child welfare advocates to increase their knowledge and capacity to implement good outcomes for trafficking victims. Lori strongly advocates for the wisdom of survivors and the voices of children as essential in preventing child sex trafficking. Before I give a floor to Lori, I'm also the housekeeper here. Just a couple of uh, items. One, please keep your microphone on mute. And the second, if you have questions for any of our panelists, please put them in the chat, which will be moderated by our wonderful ECPAT team. So now it's my pleasure to turn the panel over to Lori. Thank you so much, Jackie, for those kind remarks. Um, greetings and welcome everyone. I am Lori Cohen and as Jackie mentioned, I am the relatively newly minted CEO of ECPAT USA, which has for its 30 years, this being our anniversary, been the foremost nonprofit organization advocating to end the commercial sexual exploitation and trafficking of children in the United States. We are a member of ECPAT International, a network of affiliates in over 100 countries dedicated to the vision that every child has a right to a childhood free from sexual exploitation. We are gathered here today thanks to the NGO CSW virtual platform. And in the very strange circumstances of the first commission on the status of women since its founding in 1946, not to take place at UN headquarters in New York. Though we miss the personal contact, we are fortunate through technology to still gather colleagues from all over the world. The 2030 agenda for sustainable development adopted by all UN member states in 2015 and enthusiastically endorsed by civil society has become a priority working plan for UN entities, including the Commission on the Status of Women. It is a quote, blueprint for a better and more sustainable future for all. The achievement of each of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, is necessarily linked to progress on the others. Although the focus of our conversation today will be around Goal 10, reducing inequalities, there is no question that Goal 10 cannot be reached without achieving Goal number one, no poverty. Goal the goal number, I lost it, zero hunger. Goal number three, good health and well being. Goal number four, quality education. And goal number five, gender equality. Leaving no child behind is a tall order because inequalities start with birth. Who are your parents and where were you born? Our panel will focus on how disadvantages encountered by some marginalized groups place children at risk for commercial sexual exploitation and what interventions can be made to build individual and community protections. With us today is an impressive group of panelists. 
Cornelius Williams is an Associate Director and Global Chief of Child Protection for UNICEF's Program Division. For over 30 years, Cornelius has managed child protection programs with UNICEF and saved the children. He has been involved in advocacy that led to improved protection of children from sexual exploitation and abuse in humanitarian settings, reduced recruitment and use of children by armed forces, and increased access of children to identity documents, birth certificates, and social assistance. Cornelius represents UNICEF on the advisory boards of the We Protect Global Alliance to End Child Sexual Exploitation Online, ID for America, CPC Learning Network, and Changing the Way We Care. Mr. Williams is a national of Sierra Leone and holds a master's from the University of East Anglia, UK. Christine Stark is a native Ashinaabe and Cherokee, uh, award-winning writer, researcher, visual artist, and speaker. Her novel, Nichols, A Tale of Discussion, of Dissociation, excuse me, was a Lambda literary finalist. Among other works, Chris is the co-author of the groundbreaking research, Garden of Truth, the prostitution and trafficking of native women in Minnesota. She has worked as a two-spirit program director at Minnesota Indian Women's Resource Center and currently facilitates art and writing groups at Breaking Free in St. Paul. She is a member of the Minnesota Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women Task Force. Chris's second novel, Carnival of Lights, is forthcoming this spring. To see her impressive biography and to pre-order her novel, please visit www.christinestark.com or the CSW event link. This is Ms. Stark's fifth time speaking at a UN event, and I am delighted to introduce her as a member of ECPAT USA's Survivors Council. Elena Letsky is program manager of the Interregional Center for Women's Support, an NGO in Russia focused on women's empowerment and child safety, combating human trafficking and providing crisis assistance to women and girls. Elena manages a number of projects presenting involvement of children in sexual exploitation and abuse. She also conducts training for youth, social service providers, students, and educators. ECPAT USA is fortunate to be partnering with the Interregional Center for Women's Support on an initiative sponsored by the Eurasia Foundation's US-Russia Social Expertise Exchange, more of which we will hear about shortly. Elena will be serving as a translator for our next panelist, Glyphira Samatoy. Glyphira Samatoy is a remarkable young woman and youth leader who manages the Children's Online Safety Program for the Interregional Center for Women's Support. In 2020 and 2021, Glyphira actively participated in the World Skills Program activities. Currently, she attends a local college and aspires to be a professional, professional chef and pastry chef. She enjoys art, dance, and participates in different sports activities. And last but not least, Christian Tawala, who is the director of ECPAT USA's Educational Initiatives Program. Christian is a progressive educator who believes in empowering students to be best prepared for life. He previously has worked as a teacher, school leader, and instructor in higher education. His nonprofit work has always been focused on providing kids with resources and an opportunity for growth. Christian received his BA in history from City College of New York, an MA from NYU University of New York University in secondary social studies education, a master's of public administration from John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and most recently, a doctoral degree in educational leadership from St. John's University. His research interest lies in educational equity, school choice, and education. Before our panelists speak, I would like to briefly share with you some of the tools that ECPAT USA has been providing to marginalized communities this past year. As many of you may know, youth education is foundational to the work of ECPAT USA and our in-person Youth Against Child Trafficking or WIACT program was our main means of educating young people until one year and one day ago. 
when COVID-19 shut down the New York City public school system. As we saw schools lock their doors, ECPAT USA immediately knew what would become apparent to others in the months following. In times of economic, social, or environmental upheaval, the risks of child sex trafficking and exploitation increase exponentially. The global pandemic triggered all these crises and the closure of schools, while necessary to protect against the spread of the virus, exacerbated underlying vulnerabilities for children. Schools are vital safety nets for all children, but an even more critical lifeline for children from marginalized communities, students with unstable housing or food insecurity, who have experienced childhood sexual or physical abuse, students in foster care, students from communities of color, LGBTQ students, young people with disabilities, students who even pre-pandemic were at an elevated risk of exploitation. Now, not only was ECPAT USA staff cut off from these students, they were cut off from teachers, school nurses, guidance counselors, friends, the fragile safety net that allowed them to access information and also to seek help if they were being exploited. Simultaneously, the transfer to a virtual world while granting access to the classroom also exposed children to a vast network of pedophile recruiters and exploiters. To ECPAT USA, the impact of school closures was itself the basis of a public health crisis, albeit one that was not yet discussed publicly. To raise the alarm, we rolled out an informational campaign called Safety Beyond Handwashing. Working closely with members of our Survivors Council, we developed simple to read, downloadable documents for young people that provided no nonsense guidance about online exploitation. Discussing such topics as sexting, catfishing, sextortion, and trafficking. Knowing that alarmist rhetoric would turn off rather than inform kids, we did not try to discourage them from accessing the internet, but instead gave them tools so that they could protect themselves online while learning in their virtual classrooms and while socializing with their real and virtual friends. <sighs> Student guides were an immediate success and we started to receive requests for them not only in New York, but across the United States and indeed around the globe. Kids understood immediately the information in these guides, but it became apparent that their parents or other adult caretakers did not. We recognized that pre-pandemic forms of child supervision meant nothing to a COVID lockdown family where an adult caregiver does not understand the social media or gaming sites their child is using but where a stranger could be waiting to groom that child for online sexual exploitation. Working again with our Survivors Council, we developed introductory guides for parents and caregivers, complete with screenshots of social media apps and arrows pointing to privacy settings. We created a third set of informational material for educators in an effort to help teachers and school administrators ensure a safe, learning environment. ECPAT USA has been seeking to make these resources available to another marginalized community, immigrants who speak languages other than English. We rolled out Spanish material almost immediately after the English version was published and subsequently Chinese. Today, we are pleased to share that we have uploaded Vietnamese language documents and plan to be sharing versions in Korean and Russian shortly. Access to knowledge during the pandemic is more urgently needed than ever. And ECPAT USA is committed to providing tools for young people and their adult caregivers that remain relevant. And with that, I'm very pleased to turn it over to Cornelius Williams. Thank you very much, actually. I mean, let me start by um, apologizing for being late. I had some uh, technical challenges and uh, I'd like to put up a PowerPoint that um, I had put together for 
Right, okay. Well, good morning and again, thank you, Laurie, for the introduction. I'm very pleased to join this parallel event, actually. Um, I will share some of UNICEF's global experience and data on child sexual abuse, exploitation, and future priorities for ending violence against children. I will also speak about the important role of children and young people in the movement to end violence against children. And I had Laurie, I got part of what you were saying about children as well being part of this. Violence against children actually, I mean, again, it's a global issue. Uh, every child should feel safe at home, in school, in the community, and especially online, as Laurie, you mentioned. This fundamental right to be protected from all forms of violence is enshrined in the Convention on the Rights of the Child and other international human rights treaties and standards. The international community has also incorporated specific targets targets five and target 16 in the sustainable development goal to end all forms of violence against girls and boys, as well as harmful practice by 2030. Despite this commitment, violence against children persists at an alarming rate around the globe. It's estimated that about half of the world's children are subjected to corporal punishment at home. Um, Half of students 13 to 15 experience peer violence in around school where they're supposed to be safe in school. At least 120 million girls actually, about one in 10 uh, have suffered some form of forced sexual contact before the age 20, one in 10. All these statistics, are not, if they're not disturbing enough, the actual figures are actually much higher. Perpetrators of violence often go to great lengths to conceal their acts, leaving children vulnerable to further abuse. Particularly in the case of sexual violence, many victims never tell anyone. We've now seen in the media how years after women, men are coming out and saying they were abused as children. So no matter what forms of violence a child is ex exposed to, their experience can lead to serious and lifelong consequence. We know that actually it can result in physical injury, sexually transmitted infections, anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts, unplanned pregnancy, and even death. Long-term behavioral impact on children, including aggressive antisocial behavior, substance abuse, risky sexual behavior, criminal behavior. We also know that violence is intergenerational and cyclical, males who experience childhood violence are more likely to perpetrate violence against their wives or partners, and girls exposed to violent household and harsh punishment makes them more vulnerable to experience violence from their intimate partner later in life. The issue of sexual abuse demands a specific focus. In many parts of the world, child sexual abuse is still a taboo, hidden, and stigmatize topics that people do not want to talk about. While the rapid rise and uptake of digital technology, again, Laurie was talking about, has brought many benefits for children's lives, it has also introduced new forms of harm and exacerbated the offline sexual abuse of children. One, one of the things we try to specify when we talk about when we talk about the online, okay, is that this is a physical activity in a physical space that is being digitized. So we want to know that the offline sexual abuse of children has been exacerbated by the online. There are significant increases in online grooming of children for sexual abuse and exploitation, live streaming of sexual abuse content, uh, of sexual abuse and the distribution of sexual abuse content. While the full impact of COVID-19 on children's risk of exposure to violence and exploitation is still largely unknown, we know that actually COVID-19 did exacerbate the drivers of online sexual exploitation. There are risks emerging at a time when social distancing measures have caught children off from many of their positive and supportive relationships they rely on when in distress. 
And when 1.8 billion children in 104 countries are affected by significant disruption in violence prevention and response service due to COVID-19, this is from our data, then there's something to say about that. So um, let me move on to the next slide. But despite the devastating impact of sexual violence in all of its form, most child victims never speak or receive help to recover. Based on data from 30 countries, only 1%, remember what I'm saying, only 1% of adolescent girls who've experienced forced sex reach out for professional help. Where are the 99? How are they coping? And what are their life trajectory? What quality of life are they living? The 99% are human beings. It's not just data or statistics. Very low rates of persecution of sexual affluences persist in many countries across the world. If the police do not enforce the law and child protection services do little to respond to children who are sexually abused, then victims are more reluctant to disclose their experience and seek help and are vulnerable to further victimization and perpetrators have impunity. We still are not at the point where law enforcement is able to enforce the law, no matter what laws you put in place. It needs serious capabilities to be able to enforce those laws and specific and specialized skills. For us in UNICEF, Violence against children we know is widespread, pervasive, but it is not inevitable. Today, there's a growing body of evidence that shows how communities can be made safer for children. One of the things we need to know, we need to change the narrative. We need to show that violence is preventable. We do not have to wait until a child is affected or a child is abused to then come in with remedial action. Violence is preventable. And we guided by the Convention on the Rights of the Child, okay, work with partners across the world to prevent and respond to violence against children. We address violence in all its setting and it's all its form. And we're supporting governments to achieve the targets, the SDG targets that I spoke about. At global level, we are part of a global alliance and set technical guidelines, guidance to comprehensively address violence against children. We also improve data availability and build evidence, which helps raise awareness and enhance political will and hold decision makers to account. Through our country offices, we collaborate with governments and with partners in business, civil society, faith-based organization and the media. Our efforts strengthen laws and policies to improve service delivery for children and families. We also support parents and caregivers through parenting initiatives while working with young people to ensure their voice shape our programming. And we are working with communities to tackle harmful behaviors and social norms, advocating for social change that promotes safe environment. Last year alone, we worked across 144 countries. We reached 4.2 million girls and boys who had experienced violence with direct service support, including health and social work and justice services. This was more than double those reached in 2019. So while national governments, okay, right? While we have seen impressive strides to end violence against children, but we're still faced with huge hurdles, many of which have been rising in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. Going forward, we urgently need to accelerate action to prevent and respond to child sexual abuse. While national government hold the primary accountability for the protection of children from sexual abuse and exploitation, we know that children and young people also have an important role to play. There are numerous examples from our work around the world of the ways in which children and young people have actively participated in policy research and campaigns. Okay, awareness raising, designing the service and the delivery, related to violence prevention and response. For example, children and young people can be actively engaged in the effort to shift harmful norms and behavior that perpetuate sexual violence. These include gender inequalities and social norms around masculinity, sexuality, 
male sexual entitlement and hostile, disbelieving, victim blaming, stigmatizing attitudes. Children have a role to play. Safe education in school, home and community settings for parents and young children, for example, can focus on safety in relationship with adults and peers. Good touch, bad touch. This content should include body parts, recognizing inappropriate touching or other forms of sexual behavior, including online, who to talk to about this. Programs for older children age 10 plus can address sexual victimization and perpetuation and include the concept of consent and skills to ensure respectful and gender equitable peer, family and intimate relationship. We also know many countries face challenges in ensuring that these services are accessible and relevant to the needs of children and young people at risk or experiencing different types of sexual violence. As part of addressing this challenge, children and young people can be directly involved in efforts to map needs and, uh, and availability of service from community level upwards. Our evidence shows that inclusive and ethical consultation with young people can improve services. Good quality health, social care, justice, and support services for victims can reduce the long-term impact of sexual violence, thereby also helping to prevent abuse in the next generation. I have a couple of key, uh, key takeaways now. The first takeaway, we must accelerate multi-sectorial action to address the risk in digital environment. The second takeaway, we must increase investment in prevention of violence based on the new evidence that we have. This evidence was not available a decade ago and government must now take up this evidence and be supported to have a multi-pronged strategy to prevent and end violence. As uh, again, children and young people will be, the grow, be a growing part of the movement to end violence. If we are able to influence the children and young people, they're going to change, uh, they will be a paradigm change. They will be the ones who will be championing prevention. As children now, as adults and young people, as parents, as service providers, as politicians, as leaders, they will be champ championing. They will be the agents for change. Children and young people can stand up against child sexual abuse in their communities, spur governments to adopt effective policies and invest resources to protect children. We look forward to working with all of you to ensure that every child can live a life free from sexual abuse and exploitation. I thank you. Thank you, Cornelius, for those extremely uh, enlightening remarks. Um, it is my tremendous uh, honor and privilege to introduce our next speaker, Chris Stark. Anin, Indishnukaz Nagamo Zibi Unse Kwe. That is my Indian name. And uh, my English name is Chris Stark. I'm Anishinaabe, and I am Cherokee. And I am. Uh, currently residing in Minnesota. Uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, is uh, violence against uh, uh, Native children, but also Native women. Um, Native women are the backbones of their communities. And if, uh, you know, um, we're not healthy, then our children are not going to be raised uh, healthy. And um, I want to start uh, before contact, before Columbus uh, came to the Caribbean, and um, at that time, and as it continues today in our um, traditional communities, uh, typically women were viewed as uh, sacred and children were gifts from the creator. Uh, in most indigenous languages, there are not words for uh, prostitution, sex trafficking, uh, rape, and um, violence against women and children, if it did occur in a community, were taken very seriously. Uh, there are many um, stories and examples of uh, the indigenous community um, exiling anyone who would commit violence against a woman or a child. And that's important because uh, Native people often when we're speaking to the mainstream, um, there's a lot of 
uh, stereotypes. We're in a very invisible community. And so there's a lot of uh, negative stereotypes about Native people. Um, so it's important to understand that this kind of um, violence uh, was imposed on us um, from outside sources uh, for the most part. Um, the other piece to that is because it's important, as uh, Dr. Cornelius was saying, um, it's important for us to understand that uh, when people say, well, this is just the way that it is, that's just boys being boys or men being men, there's actually many examples of cultures um, in which that is just not true and that is not the case. So I think it's important for us to, to think about that um, and to hold those up as examples for our future. Um, Christopher Columbus, uh, you know, accidentally landed in what we now call the Caribbean. And um, one of the first things that he did was to send 2000 uh, indigenous Taino people back to the Mediterranean uh, slave trade market. Um, on his third journey, he wrote about how he and his men were going about um, gathering up nine and 10 year old girls and selling them in the term that we now call sex trafficking. Uh, as uh, colonialism expanded uh, up into what we now call North America or what we indigenous people call Turtle Island, um, the institutions of uh, prostitution, sex trafficking, uh, those were uh, uh, embedded immediately in those um, colonial uh, colonies. And particularly in the first um, you know, 100 or 150 years around there, uh, it was primarily Native women uh, who were here as the European men were coming over. Um, Andres uh, Resendez, if anyone is interested, you can look up his work. Uh, he wrote a book called The Other Slavery. And in it, he documents that there were between two and a half and five million uh, Indigenous people on Turtle Island uh, that were enslaved by all of the European countries that originally um, came over. And so there is this embedded system of slavery. He also says that um, this, uh, these slavery routes and these institutions um, of slavery that were brought over again and embedded, um, that they are the, um, uh, the precursor to what we now call sex trafficking. So for indigenous communities, uh, when we think about the kinds of things that are going on in our communities right now, um, we have to look at that history and we also have to look at our traditions in order to um, move beyond uh, what is um, currently going on and what has happened to us. Um, and so one of the things that's also important when we're talking about violence against uh, Native women and children is to understand that unlike every other group of women in the United States, the primary perpetrators against Native women um, are not Native men. So again, this history of colonization and the violence that was targeted and inflicted on indigenous women uh, and girls and sometimes boys as well um, is, is uh, you know, as, again, a continuation of that so that what we're experiencing now in our communities, it's not like history repeats itself. Uh, for indigenous communities, history really hasn't stopped. So uh, we look at, um, the role of the Christian church, and we look at the role of corporations and the roles of government and how they worked together to clear the land so that the settlers could come in. And in that process of warfare and dislocation and chaos, um, it was native women and girls in particular who played or um, paid an enormous price examples of George Washington's troops laying waste to a whole native settlement and then capturing some of the younger girls and um, you know, raping them. I mean, they were using euphemisms at that time, raping them and then putting them to death in a most shameful manner. Uh, there's many examples of the military, <coughs> sorry, my dog, um, or uh, other forms of militia uh, throughout uh, you know, a few centuries of um, attacking and native colonies many times uh, the native people there had uh, you know waved a truce flag and um, they would just come in and just kill everyone they would cut out the um, women's um, private parts and put them on their hats or put them on the 
um, the saddle horn of their horses and ride them around. So what we're talking about is a history of tremendous sexual violence and exploitation committed against uh, Native women and girls. And um, the extractive industries were also a part of that as well. They played a large role in that. And so one of the things that we're dealing with now in my community, the Anishinaabe community in Minnesota is again, like I said, not a repetition, but just a continuation. Uh, we have a pipeline coming through that's being forced through. Um, many of our uh, reservations are fighting that. Many are, of our bands are fighting that. And we have the, um, the things that happened with the man camps in North Dakota and Montana and all of the sex trafficking of native women and children and also uh, white children as well, including boys uh, and girls um, that were sex trafficked with those man camps, um, gang raped and so forth. And now we have that happening in our community and we stood up and we said, you know, that this is going on and we wanted to protect our, our youth from this, um, this uh, collusion between extractive industries and, and, um, and sex trafficking. Um, and we said, this is what's gonna happen. This is what's happened in these other instances. And, uh, you know, we were pretty much ignored and sure enough, uh, some Enbridge employees along with some other men from Minnesota were recently just busted in a um, in an attempt to solicit minor girls uh, in northern Minnesota, and so you know again that's just a, another way of um, this continuation of uh, the original uh, colonization, the ongoing colonization that we are currently experiencing. Uh, the Native community is significantly under resourced and underfunded. Um, there's very, very, very few resources specifically for uh, Native women and youth. And for Native people, um, that's extremely important that we have culturally appropriate services, culturally specific services run by trusted members of our communities so that our, um, our women and our youth are able to connect with traditional ways because they're our own ways. They're, they're different from white ways and different things work for native communities. I just wanted to run through um, a few uh, notes from the Garden of Truth, the prostitution and sex trafficking of native women in Minnesota. And that's a study that I was a part of uh, and it came out uh, in 2011. And um, you know, we don't have a study that focuses on native uh, children in sex trafficking, but the situation with this is that almost 80% of the women that we interviewed were previously sexually abused as children. So we know that link um, is true for many people, adults in prostitution and sex trafficking. Um, for instance, I sat down with an elder, a 59 year old uh, woman, and um, she started yelling at me, I've been raped my whole life. What else do you want to know? She yelled that at me over and over and over again. And then she told me about how she had been uh, used by family members at the age of four, starting at the age of four uh, in child pornography. So for a lot of uh, our, our native um, communities, um, what we have is we have this continuation from early childhood sexual abuse, like an arc that just continues throughout uh, the lifespan. And um, because of the multiple barriers, the multiple uh, systemic barriers that Native people experience through, um, you know, high rates of poverty, homelessness, um, barriers to education, uh, the impact of the boarding schools uh, that were um, inflicted on Native communities to dislocate and disconnect our children from our communities. Um, and then the children were severely often, many of the children, not all of them, uh, severely sexually and physically abused, used in what we would call labor trafficking now, and even sometimes sex trafficked, again, by um, clergy, businessmen, and um, politicians in the communities. So um, what we have is we have this, uh, this sense of dislocation, and we have our children being removed constantly from our communities through the boarding schools and now through CPS. Um, and so um, 
we have many adult women, grandmothers and great grandmothers that are out on the streets um, that are in prostitution or perhaps being trafficked. Um, and uh, they're being taken up off the, the streets and brutally raped with weapons. Uh, and um, this arc of uh, sexual violence uh, that, that goes on in our community, it just really has to be um, stopped. And uh, we need those resources in order to do that. And um, we care about all of our community members. We care about our children and we care about our adults and we care about our elders who are still suffering and still carrying the burden of this violence that's been inflicted on indigenous communities uh, beginning with um, Christopher Columbus. So miigwech for listening to me and um, I'm very honored to be a part of this. Thank you, Chris, so much for sharing those incredibly powerful and, and moving remarks. Um, it's ECPAT USA is just so fortunate to be able to partner with you in, in raising awareness on the critical needs of uh, indigenous women and, and children. Um, our, our next speakers, I'm very um, pleased to be uh, presenting uh, Elena Letsky and Glafira Samatoy. Today, uh, my name is Elena Letsky and here is Glafira Samatoy. Uh, today we're representing Russian NGO Interregion Center for Women's Support. Um, our center was founded in 1998. Since then, we were focused on two main courses of work, um, serving women survivors of violence and serving uh, children survivors of sexual exploitation and violence. Uh, we are an interregional organization conducting projects in various regions of Russia, including uh, Smolensk, Kaliningrad, St. Petersburg, and many, many others. Um, I wanted to take this opportunity to thank ECPAT USA and specifically Social Exchange Expertise Program funded by Eurasia Foundation. Uh, thanks to this amazing program, we were able to collaborate with ECPATR USA and receive methods and best practices from them. And this is really an invaluable opportunity for us uh, since um, considering their experience and um, accumulated expertise. For current project, um, which is focused on raising awareness about children land safety in Russia uh, and in the US uh, with creative training methods, um, we use uh, various, various approaches, and this is particularly an important project right now because uh, since uh, restrictions due to COVID-19, lots and lots of kids and adults are spending their time in front of the screen, and this is um, this poses additional threats that is my next speaker will talk about. Here is Glafira Samotoy, our proactive volunteer. Um, she is helping us to develop guides for parents on children's online safety. She's giving us perspective on children's um, living in the current times and with the current online um, challenges to online safety. She will speak about her vision of children online safety and about her role a bit. Здравствуйте, меня зовут Глафира. Я волонтер и я волонтер и спикер женского центра. Я хочу представить такую тему, как онлайн дети. Hello, my name is Glafira Samatoy. I would like to, uh, I'm a volunteer with Center for Women's Support and I would like to speak on the uh, safety, online safety of children today. Дети, которым не хватает внимания родителей, ну или проживающих в детских домах, они ищут внимание от кого-то другого. Время карантина они натыкались на общение в интернете. So here's the main issue, the issue of attendance, uh, of attention, I'm sorry. Um, kids living with parents or living in orphanages or marginalized kids are often in need of attention from adults. Uh, mostly they're caretakers, uh, but um, when they turn online, they seek for attention and find uh, wrong kind of attention. Они начинали общение с взрослыми людьми, от которых получали внимание, подарки, ну или какие-то поощрительные призы, за что они просили отправлять свои фотографии. 
it's a very common case when kids start communicating in Russia with uh, adults online uh, for attention, for uh, prizes, for uh, appreciation, for um, for money even. Um, they send their um, intimate photos or videos to these strangers and receive uh, sort of rewards, emotional or uh, financial rewards. Не осознавая всех последствий и э, совершенных ими действий, их фотографии сливались, ну, отправлялись в всякие сообщества, где э, также продавали детские фотографии. As a result, these adults uh, were exploiting these photos, selling them in closed communities in major social networks of Russia. And... Я очень часто натыкаюсь на рекламу подработки, работы для несовершеннолетних. Очень часто она возникает в ссылках, которые могут открывать дети. And what I see a lot is advertising, uh, advertisement of uh, jobs, of um, work online that I see popping up while watching content online. Например, ребенок включает мультфильм, а там высвечивается реклама веб-модели. Они привлекают несовершеннолетних к этой деятельности. Также может возникать реклама. So here is a situation when you're watching, for instance, a cartoon uh, targeted for children, for teenagers. Often, uh, often uh, you see this popping up advertising, uh, advertising webcam modeling or um, make an extra income by webcam modeling. And this is quite a common situation. Где за хорошую плату и без опыта работы, знания языка предлагают работу за границей. И глядя на такую рекламу, уже кажется, что что-то нечестно. Still we see situations in social media when you see the advertising um, online, recruiting for online, uh, recruiting for jobs abroad without experience, without knowledge, uh, without recommendations and skills. And this is still an issue. Uh, so here's, I think this is it. These are my examples. Uh, if you have any questions, please um, ask Lafira. I think, uh, and I would like to take extra time. Uh, you're welcome to take the extra time if you like. Glafira, thank yeah. you so much for sharing those experiences. Thank you for having us. This is quite a gathering. You have 84 people listening to us. <laughs> yes. From around the globe. Yes, yes. This is quite a stressful situation. <laughs> That's okay. You're doing a wonderful job. And Glafira, it's always very exciting for us to have panels where we have young people because you are the future. You are the solution. Um, and maybe you can help train adults on how to use those apps on our phones because so many of us older people just don't have the skill set. Очень здорово иметь таких спикеров молодежных, и, возможно, ты сможешь помочь нам тренировать взрослых, чтобы они могли успешно использовать эти какие-то инструменты. Да? То есть, таким образом, спасибо. Скажи. Thank you. <laughs> ah. um, well, thank you. Well, Elena, if you... Um, you're welcome to talk more about the Interregional Women's Center, but we can also wait for the Q&A section because I'm sure there'll be many people who have questions. Okay, yeah. Great, all right, well, thank you. Um, next, it gives me a tremendous uh, pleasure to introduce my ECPAT USA colleague, Dr. Christian Tuala. Muy buenos días y sean ustedes bienvenidos a esta charla. Se preguntarán, ¿qué pasó? ¿Qué idioma es este? ¿Y ahora qué hago? La verdad que quizás todo esté mal. Oh, I'm so sorry. But more on this a little later. Good morning, fellow panelists and guests. My name is Dr. Christian Toala, and today I will speak about what the education department at ECPAT USA offers and our efforts to prevent and fight child sex trafficking and exploitation. I will also highlight the importance of partnerships our youth curriculum framework is based on John Dewey's notion on progressive student-centered learning and Paolo Freire's concept of working together as a community to overcome obstacles or what he calls oppression. Our backwards plan curriculum begins with allowing students 
along with the school community to become leaders and part of the prevention and help. The students' creativity comes to light as they create a message of hope, communicating where to find help in schools and in the community, and that as individuals, they are not alone. This culminating piece comes after lessons taught around three important topics. The, the topics covered in the workshops are child sex trafficking and exploitation, healthy relationships, and online safety. These workshops are aimed to guide the students into exploring the topics, working with their peers in different activities, and finding the connecting pieces between these topics. Make no mistake about it, this is not a lecture. Because in fact, I imagine all of you hate lectures. So imagine a child, they really don't like lecture, but this is rather a student-centered environment. So you might be asking, so besides this, what else is different? Well, here's where we, we stand out because it, it's an approach that has to be done. We're able to tailor in collaboration with partnering institution, many aspects of the curriculum to the youth we are serving. Our goal is that the curriculum relates to the different communities. As such, it is a living document that can be changed, adapted to best serve our communities, to best serve our kids. The curriculum can also be tailored from a short-term model to a semester-long model. If we think about our youth vulnerabilities, we also know how traffickers take advantage of them. A tactic used at time is gaining their confidence, preying on their insecurities or sorrows, or appearing as concerned friends. One of the advantages to long, the longer model is that we get to develop a rapport with students, thus in a way allowing for a greater opportunity to work with the youth, supporting them, and actually being there for them. Time spent in a safe space, whether in person or virtual, is time away, is time away from a possible threat. Also, our curriculum is written in a language that teachers understand and can apply. It is important that teachers know that this is part of life. This is part of the education. It's not something separate. It is important that if we do not teach these workshops, right? ECPAT USA does not teach this workshop, then the educators can pick up and understand the approach that could be taken. This also allows the educator to feel far, part of the process as they can modify certain aspects of the workshop to best fit their kids. Because an educator will always tell you, I know my kids. If by any chance the educator is not a trained teacher, okay, then our train to trainer program will not only guide educators in the topic, but also how to best teach it, how to best approach it. When speaking of vulnerabilities, language enters the conversation. Imagínense, hace muy poco ustedes me escucharon hablar en español y quizás se sintieron confundidos. Well, that relates to my previous point of how I began this presentation. For a moment, you perhaps felt confused, trying to figure out what was going on. Or perhaps did the Zoom channel just change, right? We are adults and automatically we tend perhaps not to panic, try to find a solution. But for a child, this moment presents a moment of fear, doubt and vulnerability as we cannot understand what's going on because it is in a different language. The common misconception is that if a child does not understand English, they simply will not be able to learn new material. That is wrong. A child is capable of being successful at anything if given the proper resources. Currently, ECPAT USA is able to deliver these workshops and the train the trainer curriculum in English and in Spanish. In the near future, we hope to be able to offer them in more languages as equity is part of our mission. As part of a growing program, we also offer a workshop to parents on the topic of child sex trafficking through the lens of online safety, more relevant now than ever. Yet it should be mentioned that it goes beyond simply translating. See, it's easy to translate, right? We just pop the, the text into a program and it translates it for us. But we look to make it as familiar as possible in dialect to the communities. Take, for example, the word, the word friend. If we are simply translating it into Spanish, amigo will suffice. Guess what? There's also pana, llave, junta, compa, brother, men, which all mean friend. And this is only from one city of one country in South America. Partnerships are the goal, okay? EGPAT USA collaborates with schools and organizations to plan not only the instruction, but also to develop or strengthen a protocol to, of help prior to beginning our work. The protocol is crucial as if a child is identified as a victim 
the school or organization can step in and help. Among the different partners we are currently working with, we do want to highlight our work with the Brentwood Union Free School District, which will adopt an adaptive long-term model with our continued support. In the next three years, the school will engage in teaching our curriculum to high school, middle school, and fifth grade students. We will be training the educators and in turn, they will guide the students. We will remain with, at, at the district side as they are not alone in this task. The, Brent, the Brentwood School District, along with ECPAD USA, bring together not only the school community, but also community partners and resources to fight against child sex trafficking and exploitation. Another partner that I would like to highlight is Graham Wyndham, who serve kids in foster care. They have adopted the long-term model for a whole semester to best serve their youth and create an environment of safety, creativity, and power. In this model, we teach the youth, but educators, caseworkers, and coaches from Graham Wyndham join the session as a way to foster community building, rapport, and overall help. Although it has just begun, it is proving to be positive. Workshops currently are being taught in English and in Spanish. I would like to highlight our program uh, from an example uh, from a young lady who recently uh, participated in one of her workshops. These are some of the things that happened. During mid-workshop, she decided to turn on her camera. It is very difficult to teach virtually. Kids can turn off their camera, can go on mute, and we don't hear. When a child turns on that camera, it means they are feeling safe and they want to participate. Perhaps they are allowed now to engage. She asks the following questions. So how can I help? Then she made the following um, statement. The girlfriend video shows, should know that she's not alone. Then she asks, so where are the megastars? Like, Mr. where are the superstars? Are they helping? The last one really took me and, and, and struck a chord in a positive way. She said, you know what, mister? Hold up. I want to create a poem about this because people need to know they are not alone. This is power. Asking questions, wanting to help, and being part of the conversation is power. A power that can help not only her, but her peers, because peer-to-peer -peer education works. Under the current pandemic state, we have in a way successfully maintained the peer-to-peer -peer social learning model by utilizing different online applications in addition to different communication platforms to continue our work. By conducting our workshops virtually, we have been able to reach more remote communities. Understand that we recognize that there are barriers, inequities, and difficulties, but also know that we cannot afford to fail because ultimately our kids' future lie in the balance. Thank you very much. And many thanks, Christian, uh, for that um, really uh, powerful uh, presentation and the great, <clears throat> the great explanation. I'm, I'd love to learn all the other words for friend, and I'm sure somebody's going to ask in which city. Um, <clears throat> at this point, um, I would like to sort of thank everyone for joining us. Um, as we have seen, our panelists have offered some transformative approaches to addressing discriminations that make children vulnerable to trafficking. Education of children and communities are critical early interventions for child protection and preventing the risk of trafficking. Yet there is a larger context of actions that are needed to ensure social change that addresses inequalities so no child is left behind. Among them, end child poverty and build in resilience against vulnerable situations. Eliminate laws, policies, and practices that discriminate against children. Advocate for public investments in education, health, and societal protection, encourage the participation of children in decision-making. The voices of children are powerful and focus on exposing the demand aspect of human trafficking. Who are the buyers and sellers who profit from exploiting children? We need your participation to create a world with zero tolerance of child exploitation and trafficking. And again, my thanks to the participants, uh, to the panelists, to the audience, and we are looking forward to receiving your questions.
All right, so the first question is starting with the last presenter um, asking uh, Christian, how can I introduce this topic to my school? Hi, thank you so much for the question. Um, that's a hard question to be quite honest because it depends on, on leadership. Uh, I think one of the best approaches if we're planning to bring this to the school to implement it would be with showing one, how it is part of the bigger of the larger conversation. Two, how does it best benefit the kids and allowing them to grow in terms of voice, right? Leadership abilities and capabilities. The last one is showing them how perhaps it integrates into whatever they're teaching. Because our current curriculum, our current topics, right, relate very much to English language, to social studies. It's just right there. Then we begin with the actual tailoring of it, right? So the, let's say, for example, the three topics that we, we stress, which is uh, child sex trafficking and exploitation, um, online safety and healthy relationships, we can switch around the order and use lenses. Why do I say that? Because a lot of the difficulties are getting past that first step, right? Because districts or schools worry about the actual topic as Mr. Williams was, you know, it's taboo. It doesn't happen here, there's fear. Um, and the last one actually, which is very important is introducing perhaps the information first to parents that online safety and using that lens to introduce the topic of child uh, sex trafficking and exploitation goes a long way because as long as parents are on board and they understand this is for their kids' safety because it is, it is for them to become leaders and, and have a voice, then guess what? Parents will be on board. And as school leaders know, if you have the parents knocking at your door along with the students, you have a community ready to say, hey, we need this and let's make this happen. That would be one of the ways. Thank you so much, Christian. Um, this question was not directed at any of the panelists, but I'm gonna start by uh, asking Chris Stark. Um, the, I mentioned in my concluding remarks, uh, how do you focus on demand? And are we interviewing buyers and sellers? And, and Chris, I know you've done a lot of research in looking at, at victims and survivors. Um, I don't know if you can give us some insight into the sort of research done around buyers and sellers and the issue of demand. Yeah, there are, and that, that's a great question. Um, there are studies that have been done that have focused on uh, the men um, who are buying uh, people <clears throat> um, for sexual exploitation. And I can try and find them. Um, then and, and maybe put them in the chat room when I'm done talking here. Uh, but one of the things that uh, what they pretty consistently say is that if I was exposed, if my community, my family, my workplace knew that I was um, buying other people uh, in prostitution or sex trafficking, I would stop. And um, we have got to hold uh, the demand accountable and at least here in Minnesota, what we see over and over and over again um, is a, a reluctance on the part of the system uh, to hold them accountable because uh, in Minnesota and in the US, uh, the, the men who are buying, the, the primary buyers of women and children are white, straight, middle-class and upper middle-class men. And those are, of course are the people who hold you know, positions of power in our country. And so we really have to push hard at that. We have to use whatever privileges and whatever we, power we have uh, to hold those men accountable um, and to force the system to hold them accountable too because what happens is they get a pass. Um, we see that in a case called the Minnesota Nice Guys and uh, Hennepin County um, prosecutor uh, was bringing in uh, um, prostituted people um, into Minnesota and selling them to other um, white businessmen and nothing happened really to any of them. And we had one young biracial girl uh, who um, almost engaged in selling another classmate in sex and I believe that she went to jail for three years. So we see this incredible disparity um, and I'll look for those uh, resources right now. 
Thank you, Chris. I, I really appreciate it. We'll make them available to the audience after the presentation. We can try to put it on the website. And also, I know we have a number of researchers uh, in the audience, many of whom are, are, are uh, big fans of yours, Chris. So um, if there are researchers in the audience and you want to share the information with us, if you have it, we will uh, share it with the, with the other audience members as well. Can I just add one thing? Sure. Is, you know, what I just talked about really speaks to the issue of choice. If you're going to be exposed, you're going to stop this behavior versus the women and kids who are in it and are in it because they're in poverty or, you know, um, uh, being uh, trapped and so on. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I saw a question for uh, Cornelius, uh, there was a question about, could you give us more examples of children working in community to help build awareness and support prevention? And I'm actually going to take it, I'm going to take that question a step further because I was really struck by your extremely important point about you know, we're not only talking about what children need to do, what women need to do, but really what is the responsibility of men and how does patriarchy and, and this notion of male dominance play into it, which is something that really doesn't get discussed enough because there's often a focus on what do women and girls need to do to protect themselves um, rather than the other side. And it would be wonderful if you could share some examples of, of work that's currently being done in that area. So, I mean, thank you very much, actually. And uh, again, actually, Laurie, you hit on a good example of how men and young boys, we could start working with young boys to change this culture of violence, to change the culture of male privilege. And one of the things we do is to work with young boys to work with all the boys on masculinity. So in schools, actually, you can form clubs in school where these boys, actually, we have an example from Malawi where the boys form a club in their school and it's also done in places like South Africa, et cetera, and other countries. And they themselves, having walked through the steps of masculinity of how to make sure that they are not get, they don't get caught up in toxic masculinity, go out as peers and talk to other boys in their community, right? You know, and they also influence their friends who are girls, who is also in the community to get them not to accept toxic masculinity. And imagine if this generation of boys are now to grow up and to become parents, they would be teaching their kids not to accept toxic masculinity, right? That's one example. The other example is to work with girls. Actually, one of the things we do did actually, um, um, also the other thing about working with boys is to ensure that boys are part of a transformative programming the bystander effect, that boys actually engage and do, you know, they speak up when they see violence against women and girls, that the bystander effect is overcome, right? And the other final point is actually working with girls. We have an excellent program that teaches girls um, uh, defense, self-defense training. And the self-defense training for these girls actually it's not only about the physical, it's also mental, that you can be somebody who's worthy of defending yourself and you are empowered to defend yourself. And it's about the importance of yourself and your bodily integrity. Back to you, Laurie. I mean, we can share examples, actually, we can send some examples. That would be wonderful. And it's uh, it's very inspiring to see your, your work towards uh, really shifting the dialogue and shifting the way we think about um, these forms of abuse. So thank you for that work. Um, this is a question for Elena and Glafira. How did the Women's Center in Russia come about in 1998? And could you tell us more about the youth advocacy in the community? Um, yeah, I see the question. 
So uh, in 1998, um, the center was founded by uh, in Smolensk. It's a small town near uh, Moscow, um, approximately 600 kilometers from Moscow, um, by a couple of lawyers and a couple of psychologists. And so I was um, I joined personally um, the Center for Women's Support as a volunteer at the age of 19. So initially I was a yes speaker, a yes advocate, and then I became a project manager for the center. And right now we are doing raising awareness trainings with children um, with disabilities, children with mental issues, children with hard of hearing, um, and doing su such trainings and such work with children with disabilities, with special needs, requires extra effort because uh, these kids are particularly vulnerable to uh, recruitment, to online exploitation, to um, sexual predators online. And with these kids, we have to use a lot and a lot of creative approaches and creative trainings and methods. And for anyone who would like to uh, use our methodology, please feel free to contact me. I will send and share everything I know and I've gathered through years um, working with this course. Uh, thank you so much, Elena, and thank you for mentioning children with disabilities. Again, that is a you know, group of marginalized children who are so frequently subjected to child sex trafficking and exploitation, and we don't hear about it. Um, so it's uh, um, incredibly important work. Yeah, and um, I can, well, I can um, give you an example to understand what it's like um, to work with such kids. For instance, uh, we had a case with a young girl, um, a girl with um, mm, uh, mental difficulties, um, development difficulties. She got her first online profile on social medias and she was so happy about it. And you know, the second uh, message she got was from an adult predator, it turned out. And he had this photo that he um, uploaded from searching like from Google or from major search engine it was uh, completely fake and it was it would have been obvious for a kid without um, difficulties in development but it was very hard to explain for such child that this is not a guy he's presenting to be and he already has taken some photos and extort some content video content of her and it has to be a lot of efforts from various specialists to work with her and her family. So these are the issues. Thank you so much. Um, so Christian, we're receiving a number of questions from our audience member. I'm gonna consolidate them asking for how can we get more information? Are there plans for ECPAT US data uh, expand our work. So I, I don't know if you would like to address that. Sure, not a problem. Um, there's always room for expansion. I think that's the beauty of education and prevention, right? Education can link to anything and it's just a matter of sitting down and making it work, right? That, that I think that's one of the biggest things. Um, if you would like more information, please do contact me um, at, at ECPAT. I'll, I'll, I'll share my, my email and on, on the chat. Uh, so that way we can perhaps brainstorm, sit down, converse. Um, it is important that anything that we do, we do be tailored to the communities because there is not one size fits all. It has to make sense to the educators, the communities and the community service providers. That's an ease up. Um, so I say that would be the first step. Also check out our website, right? At USA.org, but please contact me. Um, so that way we can uh, sit down and chat. Um, I think expanding is a, it's a great way. Um, schools are back in session and you know, there's always room for expansion. Great, and I'm going to just add that our existing online safety guides are available in connection with this, the CSW website, they, they are downloadable and um, they can also be found on our webpage so that you certainly can get started with some of those. Uh, safety measures, including the very helpful parents manual with the diagrams and the arrows. Uh, it's a little embarrassing. Don't, if you have teenage children, don't let them see it because they'll be shocked that you don't know how to set your privacy settings, but 
there, you know, we've had a lot of parents comment that this is very um, useful. And I am looking to see more. I just also wanted to add in here um, in terms of when we're talking about strategies um, that a significant part of sex trafficking of children is happening through family members and people they know and people in the community that are close to them. Um, you know, like other forms of sexual violence, uh, sex trafficking is probably primarily happening uh, via folks who are known to the youth. So um, when, we're, when we're talking about that, we really need to keep that in mind and to educate people, including, uh, you know, to, to include um, talk about family trafficking as well. Yeah, thank you, Chris. That's really critical. And that's actually one of the concerns that uh, ECPAT USA has had during the pandemic because if children are living with adults who are exploiting them, there really are no avenues for help. And that is actually, um, one of the points that we raise for educators so that if they're able to do uh, visual Zoom sessions, they might be looking for indicators for children. Um, but, you know, Zoom clearly, even though it brings us all together, it's, it's not a panacea and, and um, it, you know, we have to just really be hyper aware. So thank you for, for raising that. Um, I am looking to see other questions. There are many, many questions coming in. So thank you all. Oh, and some are our resources. Um, there is a question that is actually directed towards me, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to answer it partially and then uh, raise it with some other panelists. There's a question about um, what is existing uh, legislation to help address the issue of, of online sex trafficking? And it's, um, it's a hard question just because the legislative initiatives that ECPAT USA is uh, working on are, are US-based and this is an international audience. Um, I can tell you ECPAT USA has been extremely involved with a coalition of anti-trafficking advocates and service providers for a piece of legislation called the Earn It Act. And the Earn It Act um, looks at um, what has been set up as a form of immunity for websites um, involving the distribution of child sexual abuse material. Um, and it puts into play some measures of accountability for websites that have, you know, honestly, well, dishonestly have, have profited immensely from being able to circulate this material. And so um, not to get too much into the weeds, but there were certain legal protections that were set up for websites and platforms when the internet was in its infancy and advocates for the Earn It Act are saying, it's time to go back and adjust some of those protections so that we make sure that children are not repeatedly, um, you know, I mean, this is a, when the photograph is taken and distributed, it's a form of abuse. And then when it's repeated over and over and over and over again, and it's impossible for that child to have that image removed for years and years and maybe never, um, that, that is then an abuse that is constantly repeated. And so we're saying it's, it's time to address that. Um, Cornelius, I don't know if you can tell us on an international level, um, or Elena, if there's any information globally uh, about similar such measures to try to address protecting children from online exploitation. Yes, actually, I mean, uh, so, um, the, power, the issues of legislation, you know, the way you mentioned it actually is, if I could say, let me start with that at the global level, right? We advocate for ensuring that all sex offenses against children are criminalized, both boys and girls, because in some societies actually, they, some tend to focus on girls <clears throat> and they only criminalize the rape of girls. In fact, actually, as I said before, 
it's such a taboo subject that sometimes they don't even want to talk about boys who also actually suffer from this. And, and sometimes they don't consider other forms of sexual violence that are non-penetrative as well. So we feel that it has to be comprehensive. With respect to online, actually, we advocate for criminalizing the criminalization of the child sexual abuse materials and grooming. Just like you said, okay, the recirculating and the act of actually sharing these materials, we believe actually should be criminalized. And then grooming is not only with relation to intent to meet, grooming is also for production of the sexual abuse material and not necessarily to meet in person. So a lot of countries have to update their laws actually to put it in, in, in line with this. And But it's not only the laws. Once you update the laws, you have to have the capability, right? And, in, in, and to um, enforce these laws. And my final point actually is the need to have clear laws and procedures for the ISP to retain this data and to provide it to law enforcement. Back to you, Laura. Thank you so much, Cornelius. It's very helpful to remember that um, even when laws are there, they're only useful if they're being enforced and there needs to be uh, a decision to actually prioritize child protection. Um, this is a question for Chris Stark, and I think this will be um, a relatively straightforward one. Chris, people are asking for more resources about the uh, information about the exploitation of indigenous communities. I know we have included some of the, well, the some of the important research that you've done. Um, I don't know if there are other resources available that you would want to post or share with the audience. Yeah, I'm part of a um, national uh, work group on uh, homelessness, domestic violence, and uh, sex trafficking. And we have two um, reports that we have done and I posted those in there. Uh, so they are there, can everyone see them? Yeah, we, we posted them or we posted the links earlier. Well, no, these are two new ones. Oh, these are two new ones. Yeah. And then also I'm, I just uh, pulled up the MMIW um, murdered and missing women, indigenous women's um, task force. I'm just posting that right now. Great. Not on my screen yet, but it will be and then we can pass it around. Um, and then briefly, because you know, one thing you mentioned uh, in passing in your remark, uh, your remarks were um, traditional healing practices and traditional approaches towards uh, helping some of the victims. Um, maybe that recover isn't exactly the right word, but address some of the, the abuse that they've uh, sustained, and I'm wondering if you can talk to us a little bit about your experience with traditional healing. Yeah, I, um, I'm a survivor of uh, family-based uh, sex trafficking, domestic violence, incest, all sorts of things, right? And, um, you know, I went through, when I escaped uh, at like 19 years old, uh, I, I was in a, a lot of um, therapy and that, you know, helped a little bit for me to be able to talk to someone and not just sit there with it by myself. But when I came back to Minnesota and I reconnected with the Anishinaabe community and became part of the community and got my Indian name and participated in ceremonies and learning from elders, you know, that's when I really started to have a life. Um, and uh, th those ways, uh, those traditional ways, they're in our beings. Um, and they're crucial to our, our healing to go back and learn those ways and be a part of the community um, that we often have been separated from. Native people have been separated from communities in many different ways. And when you've been sex trafficked, you carry that um, huge burden of stigma and shame uh, that, that you, you're a bad person and you don't belong anywhere and you shouldn't be around anyone. And the women talked about that when we did the research, uh, how damaging and how limiting those um, internal, that internalized self-hatred is. 
and um, how much they want to come back to the community and participate with the community. So those ways are really crucial. Uh, white ways are not necessarily going to uh, heal um, indigenous people and we need to have programs that um, have offer traditional ways for our healing. Thank you. It's, uh, it's, that's very beautiful and I think um, inspiring. So I, I, I'm excited to end on a, a note of hope and positive positivity. Um, I really wanna thank all of the panelists for the tremendous work that each and every one of you are doing to make this world safer for our children. And um, Glafira, as I mentioned, you are the future. We have a number of uh, young people who have been typing in and I'm really grateful to see that young people uh, are also saying, what can, what can I do? What can I do? And maybe Glafira, you can help us answer that as we close this session. What can young people do to make sure that both they and their friends, their community are safe? Ну, как-то ограничивать соцсети, наверное, mm -hmm. потому что туда допускается очень много информации, которая не нужна детям mm -hmm. и, в принципе, подросткам несовершеннолетних, и неизвестно, почему она не фильтруется. Um, so, I would like to see some filters um, from social medias that will help keep us safe online uh, and from the administration of these social medias. So uh, our presence here would be more safe. Okay. And thank you so much, everyone. Uh, enjoy the remainder, remainder of the conference. Um, I see that some people are asking for more information. You can contact us with questions and we can connect you with some of the panelists. Um, if you go to www.ecpatusa.org or you can email us at info at ecpatusa.org. And wait, I remembered my social media strategy people, wait, I have to do it this way. You can look here. So um, you can reach us at any one of those sites as well. So again, I wanna thank you so much and uh, enjoy the rest of your day, your evening, your morning, wherever you are throughout the world.